quarter fiscal year 2024 results conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lawrence Mad Madsen, Head of IR. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Andaga's first quarter of fiscal year 2024 conference call. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. Joining me today are John Cottrell, Andaga's Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Gerson, Andaga's Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, a quick reminder to our listeners. Our presentation and our accompanying remarks today include forward-looking statements, including, but not limited, to statements regarding our guidance for Q2 fiscal year 2024 and for the full fiscal year 2024, the improvement in the overall headwinds facing our industry and the impact of such changes on our ability to grow revenues and in particular, growth and expansion in our industry verticals, our continued business optimization actions, enhancements to our technology and offerings, the impact of adverse macroeconomic conditions, and our business strategies, plans, and operations. These statements are subject to risk and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those contained in the forward-looking statements. Actual results and the timing of certain events may differ materially from the results or timing predicted or implied by such forward-looking statements, and the reported results should not be considered as an indication of future performance. Please note that these forward-looking statements made during this conference call speak only as of today's date, and we undertake no obligation to update them to reflect subsequent events or circumstances other than, to, other than to the extent required by law. For more information, please refer to the risk factors section of our annual report filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission on September 19, 2023. Also, during the call, we'll present both IFRS and non-IFRS financial measures. While we believe the non-IFRS financial measures provide useful information for investors, the presentation of this information is not intended to be considered in isolation or as a substitute for the financial information presented in accordance with IFRS. Reconciliations of such non-IFRS measures to the most directly comparable IFRS measures are included in today's earnings press release as well as the investor presentation, both of which you can find our, on our investor relations website or on the SEC website. The link to the replay of this call will also be available on our website. With that, I'll turn the call over to John. Thank you, Lawrence. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you're all well. We're pleased to be here to provide an update on our business and financial performance for the three months ended September the 30th, 2023. We reported revenue totaling £188.4 million for Q1 of our fiscal year 2024, representing a 0.6% year-on-year decrease in constant currency from £196.2 million in the same period in the prior year. Sequentially, revenue was up by 0.2% in constant currency on the previous quarter. We ended the quarter with an adjusted profit before tax for the period of £29.8 million, representing a 15.8% adjusted profit before tax margin. On our last earnings call in September, I mentioned that we're inherently conservative, but are seeing real signs of improvement, which should impact our second half of fiscal year 2024. Whilst the world has become more unstable over the past two months, we continue to see sizable new opportunities entering and progressing through our funnel, as well as new assignments commencing and scaling. I will shortly go through some case studies 
and a number of these illustrate work which starts small and ramps as we move to production environments. Mark will come to our guidance later, which we have broadly maintained on the basis that the uplift in the second half continues to firm up. We continue to prioritize our efforts on larger relationships that can grow and scale. We have a total of 145 clients, each paying us in excess of £1 million per year in the quarter just ended, compared to 140 in the same period last year, representing nearly a 4% year-on-year increase. Additionally, we had 33 clients, each paying us in excess of £5 million per year in the quarter just ended, compared to 25 in the same period last year, representing a 32% year-on-year increase. Over the last several years, we've seen an interesting trend emerge with many of our customers. The proliferation of application programming interfaces, or APIs, as a common building block for modern products and services has opened the door to a new way for companies to interact with their partners and customers. Many of these companies have begun extending functionality externally that would historically have been reserved for use inside their organization. An example of this is embedded finance, where financial services products are made available to other organizations. This has meant that companies in industries including health, retail, automotive, tech, logistics, and insurance have all started to embed financial services products into their customer journeys. For these businesses, this often provides new revenue streams, wider value-added services, and often increased customer retention. For the end customer, this is manifested in experiences such as being offered an instantaneous loan at the physical point of sale and buying from a retail, being offered temporary insurance when taking a scooter ride, being able to see real-time availability of parking spots to reserve and pay for them directly from a mobile app, or being able to have your car infotainment system store your payments credentials and automatically pay for tolls as you pass by a checkpoint. All of these are real-world examples of solutions that Endava has helped our clients build. Endava is finding opportunities to help the providers build their embedded finance solutions, but also with the businesses across many industries who are embedding these services into their customer journeys. Endava's experience enabled us to engage very early to help establish strategy, build proof of concepts, and then integrate and develop production systems. Digging a little deeper, the emergence of payments as a service as a subset of the use cases under the embedded finance umbrella has played particularly well to Indata's strengths and rich history in the payments and financial services space. Our deep expertise in building large-scale payment systems and integrating with major payment providers across the world has made us a go-to partner for customers looking to incorporate payment services into their businesses. Additionally, many of the creators of those payment services are banks or other financial institutions that Indava also has strong experience supporting. Our unique position in the payments industry has allowed us to help customers in retail, media, logistics, transportation, and many other industries design, build, and integrate key financial services technology to enable their payments, lending, and issuing as a service products. Today, I will highlight some of the projects we are working on in embedded finance. In the mobility space, we are working with a global car manufacturer which had first embedded their first generation of payment services into both the app and the in-car experience, allowing consumers to seamlessly pay for services such as fuel, parking, or charging from their car. Indava was initially approached to consult on how to build an embedded payments ecosystem in order to expand the client's presence globally and to allow it to interact with a vast network of external parties. We advised the client on how to streamline their platform by building a robust and scalable architecture, how to integrate to the complex network of payment partners, 
and how to commercially structure the proposition across multiple geographies. The project evolved, and Indaba is now working on building the client's new target state platform, including payments orchestration as a unifying component, which will enable the addition of new components as the client expands globally. Building on this experience, we continue to find and help other global automotive OEMs who are seeking to engage with their customers and discover new embedded payment revenue streams through strategic consulting and downstream execution. In the healthcare space, Indava has been working with a US-based company that provides a comprehensive suite of practice management, electronic record keeping, patient engagement, billing, and collection solutions to medical practices. The suite of services includes an arrangement with their payment processor, whereby the client embeds their products and services, including POS terminals, web-based payments, and so on, for costs borne by patients. With their existing payment processing model and processor arrangements, they were unable to take advantage of increased payments revenue. Indava provided a payment strategy, financials, and operational processes that allowed our client to add net new recurring revenue streams to their business. In the insurance space, Indava has been developing the new gold standard in customer experience for one of the largest healthcare insurers in North America. We were engaged to take a holistic look at their infrastructure and member experience and create the vision and roadmap for member experience, including embedded payments. We are now working with their new ecosystem partners to create the implementation plan and execution strategy for 2024. This includes a new payment gateway to deliver a new modern payment experience to their members. In the payment space, we are working with Patrix, a startup company based in the UK, to assist with the greenfield development of their product. Realizing the increasing need for efficient B2B payments and support for increasingly complex geographical routes, they wanted to introduce a product that would enable smooth integration from leading financial services providers worldwide through a single contract and API. The objective is to offer a straightforward and adaptable solution that unlocks access to a diverse ecosystem of providers. The benefits would translate into a service that platforms could use to seamlessly embed complex payments transfers and allow them to easily expand into new geographical markets. We used our payments and architecture expertise to identify the overall business requirements and help the client with the product ideation and discovery. We help design an enterprise level architecture that is intended to be reusable and scalable. A minimum viable product was developed and launched within five months. It enabled real-time transactions with an internal back office for staff members and an external user interface for end customers. Also in the payment space, we formed a strategic partnership with Stripe, which marries industry-leading product capabilities with our best-in-class engineering capabilities. Stripe has been a pioneer in embedded finance offering the ability for merchants to use their services to collect payments and even offer cards to their customers. However, global platforms are complex and require industry-specific expertise. Working in collaboration across insurance, automotive, banking, and gaming, Indava helped bring Stripe's vision to life. Recent examples include our work in the automotive industry to enable an industry-first peer-to-peer marketplace allowing users to create their own revenue streams from their car, whilst also providing a more carbon neutral option to people running multiple cars. A leading European payment fintech, which provides services to address the needs of the rapidly growing B2B marketplace, was facing strains due to its rapid growth. The client services over 2,500 leading platforms and marketplaces. To support its growth, the client needed a partner that would transition their current infrastructure to a modern, scalable, and globally transportable cloud approach whilst not jeopardizing their regulated status. Indava was selected as their provider of choice 
both financial services and AWS expertise. The migration of both staging and production was done successfully on an extremely tight deadline of less than four months, enabling the business to continue to grow without service interruption. We helped a UK payment platform define and develop a scalable and modern embedded finance product. Their vision was to offer a tailorable and fully embedded finance experience into their customers' website. The service offers merchants access to multiple lending partners from a single user experience, enabling the offering of tailor-made lending options to meet a range of different market requirements. The product we built allows for a complete consumer journey with lender-specific loan products, soft eligibility checks, and account creation. We're also building for them a merchant service portal as well as a lender servicing portal, allowing for the full merchant journey, assisting with onboarding flows, know your customer, know your business, and anti-money laundering checks. The flexibility and scalability of this platform allows our client to quickly adapt to ever-changing market demands. Indava has been working with Explore Technologies, a global platform integrating virtualized SaaS solutions and embedded payments to help everyday life businesses succeed. We help them to enhance their US payments platform to enable them to serve a more global market by migrating to Azure Cloud and developing a new payment processing capability for the UK and the EU. The global payment platform now allows for automated merchant onboarding and reconciliations and is supported via application program interfaces. Software development kits for web and mobile, as well as native payment app technologies. With our support, Explore Technologies is solidifying its position as an industry leader in seamless software and embedded payment solutions for businesses in the early education, fitness and well-being and field services verticals. On the technology side, we continue to see demand for experience-based capability in the generative AI space. Increasingly, our conversations are moving beyond simple internal use cases and instead moving to a requirement to industrialize and harden proof of concepts and then readying them for enterprise deployment. As we continue to have more in-depth conversations with our clients about the benefits from AI of manual efficiency, process augmentation, and, and autonomous agents, we are increasingly using our internally developed AI platform to rapidly demonstrate how our clients can benefit from these powerful tools. Following a recent conversation with a client, rather than simply responding with a presentation of our recommendations, our team built a working solution using simulated data that directly fits into the client's workflow. As this was developed on our platform, we could also demonstrate how this technology can be deployed into an organization rapidly, whilst knowing that the solution will scale with future usage patterns. This approach shows how leveraging AI technology within our teams can have a rapid impact on our sales cycle and customer satisfaction, as well as delivering more than just a standalone proof of concept. Enterprise systems utilizing the latest AI technologies are also demonstrating a requirement for new ways of working and expertise, similar to how clients better DevOps ways of working to best leverage cloud computing we are seeing the need to consider AI workloads and the requirement for model management, forced feedback, monitoring, and so on, requiring an evolution of DevOps way of working, which we are calling MLOps. It is this holistic view of how to leverage new technologies that places Indava at the heart of clients' emerging AI journeys. Regarding our recent acquisitions in Asia-Pac and the US, the integration process is progressing smoothly, and I'm excited about the prospects for our expanding global footprint. As we work towards achieving our Vision 30, we recently introduced One in Dava, a leadership program built around delivering career growth, growing leaders, and fostering a culture of diversity and belonging. 
for the last three years, Indaba Wellbeing has supported our people through a wealth of resources, masterclasses, and workshops organized around four pillars, mind, body, home, and community. We're committed to expanding the support we offer to ensure what wider relevancy to our diverse global community. In celebration of World Mental Health Day, we launched online wellbeing retreats, providing an immersive experience for renewed energy and focus. Additionally, we recently received the Echo Vardis Silver Medal for 2023. This places us in the top 25% in our industry and in the 85th percentile for all companies for integrating positive ESG practices across our business. Improving on the bronze medal we received in 2022, this achievement recognizes our ongoing commitment to making a positive impact in supporting our people, customers, and the communities where we operate. We ended the quarter with 11,761 employees, a 2.5% decrease from 12,065 in the same period last year. In the current environment, our recruitment is focused on areas of demand, as well as continuing to strengthen our sales and marketing team. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all Indarvans for their loyalty and determination over the past quarters, as we have persevered through recent headwinds. We will continue to manage the business for the long term, maintaining our culture and organizational health, and creating exciting solutions for our clients and their customers. Despite the recent challenges, based on our conversations, we believe clients' activities in exploring and commissioning new products will overtake the headwinds of recent quarters and see us return to growth. I'll now pass the call on to Mark, who will walk you through our financial results for the quarter and provide guidance for the coming quarter and the fiscal year. Thanks, John. Indava's revenue totaled £188.4 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, compared to £196.2 million in the same period in the prior year, a 3.9% decrease over the same period in the prior year. In constant currency, our revenue declined 0.6%, which reflects a 7% positive inorganic contribution during the quarter. Sequentially, revenue was up by 0.2% in constant currency on the previous quarter. Profit before tax for Q1 fiscal year 2024 was £17.3 million compared to £38.6 million in the same period in the prior year. Our adjusted profit before tax for the three months ending September 30th, 2023 was £29.8 million compared to £39.5 million for the same period in the prior year. Our adjusted profit before tax margin was 15.8% for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, compared to 20.1% for the same period in the prior year. Our adjusted diluted earnings per share was 39 pence for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, calculated on 58.4 million diluted shares as compared to 54 pence for the same period in the prior year, calculated on 58.1 million diluted shares. Revenue from our 10 largest clients accounted for 35% of revenue for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, compared to 33% for the same period last fiscal year. Additionally, the average spend per client from our 10 largest clients increased from 6.4 million pounds to 6.5 million pounds for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, as compared to the three months ended September 30th, 2022, representing a 2.3% year-over-year increase. In the three months ended September 30th, 2023, North America accounted for 30% of revenue compared to 35% in the same period last fiscal year. Europe accounted for 25% of revenue compared to 22% in the same period last fiscal year. The UK accounted for 35% of revenue compared to 40% in the same period last fiscal year, while the rest of the world accounted for 10% compared to 3% in the same period last fiscal year. Revenue from North America 
declined 15.6% for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year. Comparing the same periods, revenue from Europe grew 8.8%, the UK declined 16.0%, and the rest of the world grew 180.2%. Starting this quarter, we are providing additional granularity on our vertical mix. Revenue from payments declined 14.7% for three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year, and accounted for 27% of revenue compared to 30% in the same period last fiscal year. Revenue from Banking and Capital Markets, or BCM, declined 14.4% for three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year, and accounted for 14% of revenue compared to 16% in the same period last fiscal year. Revenue from insurance grew 32.3% for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year, and accounted for 8% of revenue compared to 6% in the same period last fiscal year. Revenue from TMT declined 1.9% for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year, and accounted for 23% of revenue unchanged from the same period last fiscal year. Revenue from mobility grew 6.7% for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year, and accounted for 11% of revenue compared to 10% in the same period last fiscal year. Revenue from other grew 4.7% for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, over the same period last fiscal year, and now accounts for 17% of revenue compared to 15% in the same period last fiscal year. Our adjusted free cash flow was £16.0 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, compared to £21.8 million during the same period last fiscal year. Our cash and cash equivalents at the end of the period remained strong at £168.2 million on September 30, 2023, compared to £164.7 million at June 30, 2023. Capital expenditure for the three months ended September 30, 2023, as potential revenue was 0.4% compared to 1.7% in the same period last fiscal year. Now, turning to our outlook for the Q2, and the full year fiscal 2024. As John mentioned in his remarks, we continue to see sizable new opportunities entering and progressing through our funnel, as well as new assignments commencing and scaling. So in that regard, the guide is little changed from that initially outlined on our last earnings call. We still anticipate an uplift in revenues starting in Q3 of fiscal year 2024, with recovery to historic levels of growth and profitability by Q4 of fiscal year 2024. With that context, let me now turn to the guide. Our guidance for Q2 fiscal 2024 is as follows. Endava expects revenue will be in the range of £184 million to £185 million, representing constant currency revenue decrease of between 8.5% and 8.0%. And DARVA expects adjusted diluted EPS to be in the range of 28 to 29 pence per share. Our guidance for the full year fiscal year 2024 is as follows. And DARVA expects revenue to be in the range of 791 million pounds to 805 million pounds, representing constant currency growth of between 1.0% and 2.5%. And DARVA expects adjusted diluted EPS to be in the range of 1.59 to 1.6 pounds per share. This above guidance for Q2 fiscal year 2024 and the full fiscal year 2024 assumes the exchange rates on October 31st, 2023, when the exchange rate was one British pound to 1.21 US dollar and 1.15 euro. This concludes our prepared comments. Operator, we're now ready to open the line for Q&A.
We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then two. Our first question is from Ashwin Scherweiker of City. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, and uh, uh, yeah. thank you for all the uh, incremental details with breakdown uh, that you provided. Um, I, I guess the first question I have is with regards to the higher visibility that you seem to that you seem to allude to. Is there a way to perhaps um, quantify that in terms of um, you know how much is already contractually um, contractually lined up, so to speak, versus how much more needs to get get sold and get ramped. Um, and, and then a related question is obviously in the last fiscal year, you, you had a uh, a couple of uh, very idiosyncratic impacts to your revenues, for example, uh, FIS um, in the PE situation, if you can provide an update on uh, what's included in your outlook as it relates to those. Yeah, thanks, Ashwin. Um, I mean, I'll just give a little bit of a uh, headlines to frame it and then Mark come in with a little bit of detail. Um, so from a uh, client point of view, we're basing it on our sort of historic visibilities that we've had coming through the pipeline. Now, that's always been a mixture of uh, contracted business, committed business, and, and pipeline business that's coming through. Uh, and we're following the normal patterns uh, that we've had uh, in terms of assessing that. Now, what we're um, Seeing and, and what we were reporting last quarter and continue to see growing is uh, quite a lot of strength in terms of new uh, opportunities coming into the top of the pipeline and advancing through the pipeline. Uh, and it's based on uh, those with appropriate levels of probability, using the same ones as we've, we've applied in historically, um, that we're basing uh, the uplift coming through in the second half of our financial year. Um, so we followed the normal pattern. Um, I think, you know, to, to frame it, we essentially see a pre-COVID world returning. You know, it's highly competitive as it's always been, um, but it's a context where we do well as a business with the opportunities that are coming through with our, our differentiated products and services to clients. Um, and um, you know it'll take a while to work out of the system the the nine months or so of pause in client decision making, uh, which is you know what's essentially created headwinds uh, for us over the past uh, three quarters. Um, but as that works through, we we see the normal patterns coming through in in the pipeline that we're seeing um, coming through our system. Mark, any more color on there? Yeah, I think just to back up what John was saying, um, you know, we, we forecast business uh, bottom up every month. Uh, we scrutinize the pipeline and the conversion rates from contracted into committed. Um, the pipeline is, is firming, which means uh, it becomes a smaller proportion of the guided revenues for Q3, Q4. Um, so the contracted and committed revenues is, is stepping up as a proportion uh, from the previous guide. Um, and then, if, if you, if you, I think you asked about the idiosyncratic uh, elements uh, previously as well. So, like Mastercard and FIS. Uh, so again, we have not uh, changed any of the assumption that we had there, which is basically that uh, Mastercard was going to uh, step uh, down in terms of activity in Q2, which is embedded in the guide. It's no different from the initial guidance and be relatively flat as we go into the second half. Yep. 
um, as we pivot onto uh, new types of work with them. And again, with FIS, uh, basically we are flatlining that in terms of the outlook, and that is no different from what we said uh, last time. Although, um, you know, with the change in ownership, we would anticipate that we would get um, additional uh, work with them, but we have not factored that into the guide. Um, and then the final point, I think you touched on uh, PE. Again, we have not changed that assumption that we had uh, in the initial guide, which is basically that PE business for us will be flat uh, throughout the year. Appreciate that. And then the second question is with regards to to headcount uh, in in the quarter headcount down sequentially. Uh, obviously, you have pretty meaningful sequential growth in the second half of the year. Um, how quickly can you pivot? Uh, I guess, headcount to go to appropriate levels of uh, headcount increases uh, when you see the demand come through? So we would expect to be able to ramp the headcount pretty much, you know, um, a month or two ahead of the projects that are coming through. Uh, in the current environment, it, it isn't as tough as it has been historically. Uh, to recruit and bring good people in. Um, if it starts to toughen up, you know, we will we will just ramp ahead of that. Uh, it's pretty easy for us to uh, respond uh, as as we have done over all of the years of growing the business um, on uh, ramping headcount alongside the demand from clients. Uh, and we don't anticipate being able to do that as we go into the second half. Um, but in Q3, we, we still have a bench which we would burn through, so it'll, it'll be a Q4 issue uh, as, as it emerges. Understood. Uh, thanks, and congratulations. Good for Thanks, Asher. The next question is from Brian Bergen of TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. This is Zach Aisman on for Brian. First question we have was on the demand side. Can can you maybe provide some more color on these larger deal opportunities that support your optimism in the second half of the year? Are, are there so, certain common factors driving this influx of activity, and how would you characterize the pace of these deal ramps versus more normalized times? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we're seeing it in a number of areas. Um, the, the the pace and the demand actually uh, is strong uh, compared with uh, our pre-COVID situation, um, but we maintain an element of conservatism, um, you know, just given what's happening in the wider macro. Uh, macro. Um, the sorts of things that we're seeing coming through are, uh, you know, our traditional uh, digital transformation services. Uh, I touched on a whole bundle of those around the embedded finance area uh, in my opening remarks, uh, and we're certainly seeing a lot of activity coming from that. Um, we're also seeing uh, platform transformation type work where, you know, clients have ended up with multiple platforms uh, and they're looking to um, get some economies out of consolidating those, uh, perhaps, you know, pushing them a little bit harder into the cloud space uh, with some of the benefits that come from that transition, uh, a little bit more than the lift and shifts that uh, one has seen historically. Um, so those are the those are the big areas um, where we're seeing a step up. I think another aspect uh, is there is definitely some supplier consolidation going on in the market, um, and you know we are being a beneficiary of that uh, in seeing some of that consolidation come our way. Uh, that's probably a new thing for us. That didn't really occur for us pre-COVID. We just weren't at the scale where uh, we were we were picking up that sort of step up. Um, but we're seeing quite a lot of activity with clients where where they're consolidating and we're benefiting from it. Got it. And, and shifting to margins, so it looks like there was some upside in the quarter. Uh, what were the drivers here and, and how does it inform your view over the, the coming quarters? Yeah, so the, 
Uh, the gross margin was basically the, the driver of it. So we had slightly uh, better revenue that fell fell through um, to the bottom line. Uh, but the gross margin was better than anticipated. Uh, Utilisation um, was, was slightly up. So gross margin was better than anticipated. And we spent marginally less on SG&A um, as well. So the, so the EPS, um, you know, against the guide was up. You know, quite significantly, but the main driver has been sort of gross margin uh, to do that. But you know, having said that, given the uh, guide for Q2, uh, we do see further gross margin um, compression, which is what we, you know, guided um, at the end of our fiscal 23 back in September. Uh, so it is anticipated that we get that, and basically that is a further sort of bench that we're we're carrying and investing in um, as we get ready for. Uh, the pickup in demand that we see in the second half, and, and we continue to invest as well in SGNA, mainly in our sales and marketing um, area, but also um, in our integration work that we're doing in Asia Pacific with our, our newly acquired businesses. So there's there's no real change in the margin profile that we we outlined uh, at the time of giving die for Q1. Got it. Thank you. The next question is from Maggie Nolan of William Blair. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Maybe just to, to build on that margin question a little bit, as you're starting to think about some signs of, of stabilization or improvement, um, and you think about maybe beyond the quarter that you just um, commented on, um, what are some of the levers that you're going to start to, to push on to drive those margins back up to your long-term levels? Um, and do you think margin will recover um, in conjunction with kind of demand and revenue recovery, or do you expect um, a lag as you start to see that demand? I'll start and then jump and uh, comment. I mean, uh, I think uh, things are stabilizing. Um, despite there being you know, some unstable times. But the with recent history um, in terms of our, our rate uh, per day has been muted. We haven't seen much um, weakness in it. It's a, it's a mixed uh, picture at the moment, um, but it's basically sort of stable. Uh, and part of the recovery that we see, and it's probably beyond this fiscal, will be um, the pickup in the, the day rate as, as demand sort of recovers. Uh, but whilst uh, we're waiting for that to come through more strongly, um, it's looking at the, the cost of the, uh, the business, and mainly through um, delivery and uh, the, the, the wage uh, costs that we have in the business. So we have to make sure that you know, we balance uh, the demand that we see and the affordability in the marketplace uh, with the levels of pay awards that we're making. So we're going to be vigilant on that. And again, we uh, are going to pay close attention to SG. We are investing at the moment basically in our, our sales um, activities uh, to, to grow us for when the recovery comes, uh, but we will continue to watch that. So I think as we, we grow out of the, this fiscal year uh, and particularly get back to normal sort of run rates or more normal by Q4, that we will build the gross margin back to the levels that we've seen historically, which is you know high 30s, and then get that leverage over SGNA. Yeah, I think the, the big step up from where we are now into the second half will be as we drive utilization higher. Um, yeah. you know, we're carrying a substantial bench compared to our uh, historic levels, uh, which we've hung on to on the basis of the work that we see coming through. Uh, and as we deploy those people, we'll see the gross margin move back up as, as Mark has outlined um, and then cascade through to um, sort of EBITDA levels that we've had historically. Yeah. That's helpful, thank you. And then I, I know you commented on FIS and, and MasterCard specifically, but could you talk a little bit more broadly about spending and demand trends at your payments and FinTech clients, any differences that you're seeing between the UK and, and Europe and the US, and what expectations for these groups you factored into the full year guidance? Um, in terms of there's little change from the initial guidance, actually. I mean, payments um, is going to be a tough uh, year for us. So year on year, we'll we'll see a decline of something like 14%, we think. Um, 
but that hasn't changed from the outlook from Q, Q1. Um, again, I think banking and capital markets will be sort of stable. Again, we haven't seen any sort of change from that outlook. Um, but insurance actually looks like a, a relative sort of, you know, bright spot. TMT um, is, is, a, is slightly weaker than anticipated, but it's just at the, the margins, and that is actually across uh, most of the geos, whether it's North America, uh, UK, uh, and Europe. And again, we're not really seeing much uh, change in terms of you know, the geo uh, outlook. I think North America will, will start to recover um, more strongly than the UK, actually, in, in, if you look at it quarter on quarter. Um, but it will still not be a sort of strong year for North America in terms of year-on-year -year growth. Um, so there's, there's no real change in what we were saying eight or so weeks ago in terms of that colour. Yeah, just a couple of things to add to that. You know, we, we, the dynamic, as we see it, is much more sector-driven than geo-driven. Uh, so the sector fluctuations are driving what's happening in the geo rather than the other way around. Uh, so Europe has been relatively strong, largely because of the geos that are strong in Europe rather than because of some of what's happening in Europe. Um, the other thing is uh, we're talking about payments going down as a vertical, but actually if you look at what we're doing as a business, it's because it's becoming more of a horizontal. Uh, and some of those services that we were talking about getting embedded into the solutions that retailers and so on are offering uh, means we're still pretty busy from a payments point of view. It's just going into other verticals. And actually that's a real strength for us because it, it helps us to break into other verticals that, you know, with quite strategic conversations with clients. Uh, and then we're able to build out from that um, as we expand into other verticals outside of our traditional strength in the financial services space. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Again, if you have a question, please press star then one. The next question is from Brian Keane of Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Nate Svensson on for Brian. Um, I was hoping that you could give us an update on how the Mudbath and DEK acquisitions are performing uh, versus your expectations when you made those acquisitions. So how is inter integration work going? And then maybe how do you feel about the long-term opportunity ahead of you in APAC? And then relatedly, I think you mentioned that inorganic contribution in the quarter was 7%. Just wondering if you'd give us a, a, an update on the expectation for inorganic contribution for the remainder of the year. Yeah, so the, um, the deals that we've done in Asia Pacific are all going very well. Uh, the Lexicon one from last, well, just over 12 months ago, uh, Mudbath and Deck both settling in well, uh, actually seeing growth coming through um, uh, with their existing client base, but also winning new business together. Uh, so, you know, we feel we've established a very strong position the rest of the world. Uh, you can see it's up to 10% of our revenues now. Uh, the team is coming together really uh, strongly, uh, and you know we we see uh, great opportunities for that to convert into organic growth in that part of the world. Obviously, with DEC as well, we got the Vietnam delivery capability, uh, and we're starting to deploy that into um, some other uh, Indava clients, uh, and so spreading our footprint from. Um, from the uh, Central Europe and Latin America capability that we had historically. Uh, Vietnam in particular, you know, we're seeing demand from some of our global clients who were keen to have services uh, in the Asia Pacific arena, um, and those clients are following through on their, their asks uh, before we did the deal and actually starting to put teams together in that part of the world. Uh, so it's executing well, we're very pleased with it. Um, Mark, did you want to put some colour on the inorganic? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're right, Nate. Um, yeah, seven seven percent in the quarter was the contribution from M and A. It will uh, diminish as we go through the year, as we do the full twelve month cycle on them. Um, so for the full year, um, similar to what we we said last uh, time, contribution from uh, M and A will be about five percent, the two point five percent cost and currency in the guide. Got it. All very helpful. Um, so I don't think there's been a 
question in the Q&A on generative AI, so I will, will take the opportunity to ask that one. So can you tell us like, how much of the sales activity and pipeline that you're seeing is explicitly AI-related? I know some competitors in the space have talked about a lot of activity, but sort of not a lot in terms of actual bookings and, and booking size. And then also in your prepared remarks, you mentioned your internally developed AI platform. So maybe can you give a little more color on that platform and what differentiates it from um, other platforms that you see in the market. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for that. The, um, and congratulations on the first question on generative AI uh, in this call. Um, yes, we're seeing a lot of interest and a lot of conversations in the market. Uh, I think, you know, similar to other organizations, the challenge has been convert converting those into uh, scaled projects. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons uh, for taking you through our internally developed platform is that is all about how you convert the ideas and the opportunities from generative AI into enterprise scale deliverable solutions. Uh, so our um, platform essentially um, uses existing uh, open source and SaaS solutions. So we're not we're not creating the generative AI capability, but we're putting those onto a platform that actually enables uh, well-engineered uh, solutions to be put together very quickly uh, and in a fashion that could be integrated into an enterprise environment um, and therefore enabled to scale. And I think it's it's that engineering capability which is going to be crucial to actually seeing. Uh, these opportunities and these solutions, you know, brought to life and scaled in clients, uh, which is why we've uh, invested in that space and brought it to life. Uh, it also has benefits from, in the sales cycle uh, in the sense that, you know, we're able to sandbox very quickly um, solutions um, that, you know, relate to client workflows and actually bring those to life uh, rather than, um, you know, some sort of PowerPoint, this is what could be done type discussion. Uh, and that helps clients go down the learning curve of the value of generative AI and, and how it can uh, impact their organization. Um, so that's, that's why we brought that out. Um, you know, we, we, we like the phrase ML ops uh, that brings to life the engineering related to putting these machine learning capabilities into client solutions. Uh, similar to the DevOps uh, capability that, that got built around uh, implementing cloud solutions. Thanks. I appreciate the color. Thanks. The next question is from James Fawcett of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good morning. This is Antonio Jaramillo. Um, on for James Fawcett. Um, I have one question. I'm just curious if, if you guys could – could more broadly talk about um, your like capital allocation strategy going forward. Um, I know that like you guys have had a concerted effort um, in the APAC region, um, and just curious on that first. So the the broad principle is that uh, you know we've looked at buybacks, but concluded that actually uh, we're better conserving our capital for the right M and A opportunities. Uh, M and A that is going to you know push us down that diversification route. Um, we're still you know from many years ago diversifying out of financial services and out of the UK, uh, and we continue to push on that. M and A is one of the uh, really helpful routes to achieving that diversification. So our capital focuses around uh, using uh, using that to drive M and A. And the areas that we're particularly keen to grow on are, are the U.S. Uh, at the moment, but also some of the countries in Europe where we don't have a presence as we see opportunities there. Uh, so that's, that's what we'll be focusing on in terms of uh, where we put our money. Got it. That's all very helpful. And then for my second question, I know that you had mentioned that in your guide you're sort of flatlining um, your like private equity activity, but um, have you seen um, any meaningful activity uh, in that um, in that group? And um, if you could touch on that, that'd be great. Yeah, so I mean, the PE space, our uh, approach to market is that we have 
a diligence business that engages with PEs early in their uh, diligence uh, process around acquiring businesses. Uh, and through doing that, we help them frame their investment thesis and what they want to do from a technology point of view, as well as all the other aspects um, of why they're buying the business. And um, through that, um, that then leads to downstream work as we help them execute on those transformations. Now, you know, that's actually been pretty quiet. Um, the last three or four months, we have seen a significant pickup in uh, that diligence work and some of those deals uh, getting executed upon. Um, now, it is, it is a long cycle, uh, sales. Uh, process because you know we, we work with the PEs in uh, shaping the investment thesis. Uh, they then execute on the deals. Uh, they normally have some work that they want to do with the uh, management teams in terms of uh, shaping the strategy up around that investment thesis, um, and then uh, putting their business cases together and then executing on it. So it can be six, 12 months downstream before that work starts to come through. But we're seeing those early signs of activity uh, in terms of deals happening and, and that work going on. Um, we wouldn't expect it to have a significant impact on this financial year, um, but it's a good sign for the, the next financial year. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to John Carroll for closing remarks. So thank you all for joining us today. We're uh, excited about the market opportunities over the medium to long term from all of the technology waves that continue to emerge, some of which we've outlined on the call. We're gearing in Darla to continue as a leader as these tech waves gather strength and look forward to speaking to you on our next earning call in February. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>